So let's discuss about uh, investors. So just to cover the investors in different uh, form, we had early stage funding, we have sweat equity, we have crowdfunding. Sweat equity is when you work for uh, return of uh, ownership. You have crowdfunding, you have donation, pre-sales, equity, loans and royalties. So different types of crowdfunding instruments out there. Um, so uh, pre-sales, most prominent and known is Kickstarter. Uh, equity crowdfunding uh, depends very much in the different countries, what is the most uh, known for. You have loans and even royalty uh, models. Then you have traditional risk finance, you have accelerators, business angels and VC investors. And then of course the traditional funding, the self-funding, you put your own money there, licensing um, basically is that um, uh, someone else can grant you an asset like a franchisee and, and you start to work on based on that. You still have your own company, you have grants, you have bank financing and so forth. And of course, in the reality and the most important ones, the bootstrapping is more about the cost efficiency and, and uh, creativity in using resources but the customer funding is the, the, the most important one. So regardless of how well uh, you can do all the other things, eventually you need to get to customer funding. Um, and even if there is a, you know, investors can say, hey, we can get to that later, there's such attraction for the value when we're providing it for free, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can turn on the customer revenue in the future. It is possible, can be even likely, but it doesn't mean that you can do it. There are companies uh, that have failed when they put advertising on, or they put some business model on, and they can't sustain the operation, and they fail. At the same time, there's no single investor that would say that if you are growing well, and you are getting money from customers, that the business model is already working, where they would say it's a bad thing. It's a good thing for you, it's a good thing for company, it's a good thing for investors. So it's always a goal, because eventually it has to be there. The earlier you get it, and can have growth at the same time, the better it is. But there are justifications also to not put it on too early. But this is a strategic question for individual company. But I'm saying there's no harm of having it unless it limits your ability to get market share. But you have to understand the risk is very high. <clears throat> so friends and family as investors. So how do they behave? They usually invest because no, they know the person. They don't have to understand that oftentimes don't even understand the business model or the business. So they invest because of the trust, beliefs, relationships, and so forth. They want to help because they want to see the individual, the entrepreneur to succeed. Less care usually about the financial upside. It is there, but it's not their driving, primary driving motivation oftentimes. They also don't care too much about plans and details. It's more about the trust on the person. So it's good to consider when considering this. Also, it depends on the family relationships and friend relationship, how they can impact if the company fails and you don't ever pay back. So depending on how the conversations have been, how the relationships are, it can be you know, not an issue or it can be a friendship ending outcome. Business angels as investors, what are their driving motivators? So first of all, they are not a unique uh, individual group in the sense that they are always the same. They are very much people, they are very much individuals with variety of personalities. So they are individuals first, business angels second. 
they also often know the person or they want to know the person or they indirectly know the person through another person. It's usually based on this trust a lot as well. Or if they are really a serial, serial entrepreneur based in, uh, business angel, then they may have the industry knowledge and then through that industry knowledge, they can read into people and their capabilities and knowledge. They can be also more like entrepreneurs, like being part of, they want to be part of building something new. They may know the industry well and have other things to contribute, but not necessarily. Um, they don't have time to be operative anymore, but they still may have significant time to contribute for a strategy level. If they would like to be an entrepreneur, they would most likely start their own venture and not doing investing, or they do already entrepreneurship and only invest on the side. But they will never be the, the operative investor, uh, operative entrepreneur in a company that, where they invest, unless that's very rare, but that can sometimes happen as well. They like to learn through being part of many ventures. They like to learn from entrepreneurs. They like to learn from the markets. They like to stay on touch with the markets through their investments. Some like to be having bragging rights. That may not be the primary thing, but it is important to say what they have in their portfolio, where they have invested, how early did they identify the potential. And in some cases, you know, if it's a, you know, a new, bar they can say i'm a bar owner i have my own you know bar even if they're not operating that and to learn new things and to really also uh, new tactics uh, in the activities of the venture accelerators as investors key here is that accelerators they have quite common business model but by definition, they at least have a fixed business model per batch or per their portfolio that they execute and perhaps it really improve. But they work with the fixed business model and terms. So they are not custom negotiating with every individual investment they make. They just put the terms out and then they, they say these are the terms we uh, invite others to, to join. And they usually focus on a specific development phase and usually these days also select some specific industries and, uh, and want to be good at that phase and not in the, all the different phases. So they want to kind of find their clear value proposition, uh, value proposition and, and the business model and provide that in a fixed format. Usually the focus is to get past validation state faster. So they may think, take something that is in early validation and try to get whether that can be scaled. So if the how can be done better, uh, or if it's something very interesting and they just want to see if it can be validated at all. Um, usually they focus on specific verticals, uh, at least per batch. And, and they are connecting and feeding other types of investors with validated teams and innovations. So basically to, to execute um, their own development phase focus, but also to offer opportunities for the startups to, to connect with the next phase and also building relationships with other investors to get opportunities to teams that then investors can trust that a certain execution has been done with them. Improving their documentation, improving their team, improving their product, and improving their validation, and so forth. And then VCs as investors. So VCs, um, they really focus on startups that uh, are in their core business. So, VC's core business is to invest into startups. So that's what they do. Uh, they, they do it again with their own business model, with the different vertical that they may focus on, 
and so forth. But they are in business of investing. They have things to contribute, to support beyond the money. Mostly it's about the knowledge about the market and processes and channels towards the market. They usually seek actively the mega trends and try to align their investments and or their portfolio, sometimes even their entire portfolio, behind a certain trend. So, for example, there was a VC fund created just for iPhone apps at the time when the market uh, app, app store came. Uh, there's definitely many funds focusing on uh, specifically only for blockchain at the moment and so forth. Um, so more industry specific or even technology specific. And then also with dimension only on certain geography and so forth. Their primary focus is on return of investment. So their fund is structured upfront. The rules of how they invest is fixed. So usually it means that they have a 10 year fund where they invest and inside 10 years they close the investing. Usually they close at five years and then they do follow up rounds to those that they invested. Uh, and then they need to get exits out in the, let's say, 15 years. That's a quite common. It can be longer time, uh, not necessarily a shorter time, but really they have fixed model. They need to put money in, they need to double down, they need to get their money out. And it's important for entrepreneurs to understand at what level, at what phase the fund is. Usually uh, the, the longer term successful VCs that have several funds, so they always have kind of different capital from different funds that they manage to invest. But these are important to understand what is their fund mechanism, uh, because that will have impact on their behavior, on how the investment in your company is also considered. So I said they also work on portfolio strategy. So for them, it's calculated thing that they will fail big number of the companies. So from that perspective alone, it's important to understand that their business model by definition is not aligned with what the entrepreneurs are trying to do with their company. None of us as an entrepreneur want to fail nine out of 10 of our ventures. It can still happen, but that's not our target. It's not the target of the investor either, but instead of having it built in the business model, they have it there, whereas entrepreneurs, we don't have it in our business model. And then the next level or the additional types of investors are these passive, these more strategic investors that they follow other investors, they co-invest, they're not the lead investor, they do syndicates, uh, or they do just a little bit buy-in just to have an opportunity to invest in the future if it becomes really successful. So they may not care too much of due diligence because that's done by a lead investor, but only because they have invested. Some of the investment terms say that <coughs> the, the invest, most of them actually say that only those who have already invested, they have the first right to invest in the next round. So they usually take less participation, they don't have board seats and so forth. Um, they trust more on the other investors to manage their investments. Uh, it's even more based on just money, portfolio strategy, numbers than involvement. So therefore they are very much doing it from pure investment. It gets very close to stock market ex uh, expectation type of relationship. And they balance their risk via portfolio strategy on their own side. So they don't put true fund structure. They create their own portfolio by investing in different phases and different stages, industries and so forth. And usually also they can do it uh, in a, for a bragging rights type uh, to improve their um, 
presence or identity among the innovators. And then uh, work-based sweat, sweat equity investors. So basically this means starting from co-founders or extended teams. Uh, so those who want to work in the startup and are willing to take a lower salary or no salary for a certain period, work part-time, full-time, depending on their own financial situation. But really it's to be an entrepreneur or entrepreneurial without necessarily taking the actual founder stake and the maturity of the uh, pain and responsibility of the whole company to help balance their other work. So for example, a designer who does work in design, they could do it normally for payment, um, as just you know, selling their services, but every now and then they could take a role in a startup and do a design work as a part-time, maybe use 10% of their available time, and that way get an equity stake in the startup. Same for lawyers, same for accountants, same for all kinds of business people that would, would like to do that. So there are many reasons here listed that uh, why people would do those that can be used also to motivate, um, because you have equity, even if you don't have money, you have always equity that you can use to get resources beyond the money. And oftentimes you can get better, sometimes definitely longer term resources this way than through trying to find the money and then using the money to just pay people. Because this is also a very different type of uh, commitment uh, from the individuals who take role in this way. So I'll stop here for a while and check if there's any questions. I can see from the time that we, we have taken uh, about two hours, 15 minutes so far. Um, still the question of by Ricardo Ramos, that one about logical sub-processes, just that one we have. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the uh, in case the, the Maybe you can, Ricardo, say if you, if you have gotten answer to that already, okay. or if you have more specific question in, in regards of the sub-processes. Yeah, he just would like to hear a real example of logical sub-processes. Um, yeah. yeah, okay. So, so uh, as, as, as was mentioned, this module one is really giving an overview of these key topics. And uh, specifically when we go into the module two, uh, there's all the, the, all the kind of processes and tools and metrics to be used uh, that are relevant for ideation. When we go to module three, uh, there is all the tools and key strategies and, and metrics, uh, how to focus on uh, the validation related uh, tactics and uh, practices and tools. And then when we go to module four, in module four, we specifically focus on building processes, measuring processes, and measuring the effectiveness of processes, designing processes, uh, so it becomes more about the scaling methods, how to scale things um, and related processes. So, because those all of those are extensive on their own right, and also in the sense that they are specifically targeted for that each specific uh, validation phase. Um, that's why we have created the, the modules as their own whole own elements, because it also captures the uh, first the, the deeper essence of, for example, building a team and team commitment, and then 
how to validate the commitment and these types of things that kind of need a broader broader con context uh, to be to be given. So you can find those uh, details, of course, from the, the curriculums that we have shared for free, just to get an idea of what's there uh, to be expected on those modules. Uh, but the, for the sake of the, the time and the, the overarching perspective onto these key themes and topics on the first module, um, this is how we have, have structured it. So let's uh, get back to that uh, also at the, at the very end of this. If if uh, if we can cover some of those pieces uh, also, but for sure much more detail in uh, the following modules. Yeah, no questions anymore. Okay, so let's talk about uh, about the valuation a bit, and uh, and the valuation is of course the the uh, the whole point of how the it's measured, how the value is created for the company. So it's important to understand where the value grows from, where it comes from, and how it is used. Uh, to, to start with the term valuation, uh, it of course comes across most uh, relevant when we are thinking about investors investing money. So it's about what, what is the value of the company. So if I, you know, if you sell me 10% of the shares, uh, how much that would cost. So if that's 100,000 to, to get 10% of the company, then the valuation would be 1 million. So the valuation is the value of the company. Um, but in addition to this investment, it's also needed for other calculation purposes. So for example, finding a logical way to calculate the, the individual founder's ownership percentage uh, as well as sweat equity investments and so forth. And in addition, uh, there can be different valuations that use at the same time. For example, the valuation used for uh, those who would invest money can be different than the valuation used for those who would earn ownership through working the so sweat equity. And why so? Uh, because the value of money can be, you know, considered higher because it's more flexible tool than the value of the work that comes only through certain individuals. But at the same time, um, that can be offered to both. So you say if someone feels that the valuation they get uh, as working is is not fair for investing money. Of course, they can be offered the same thing that you can invest money as well. So in that sense, um, they, they, they can co-live at the same time. Uh, most importantly, it is uh, also a measure that kind of it's the index number of all of the success and progress of the company. So it's basically put in the, the value of the company growth as it gets more customers, as it gets more revenue, as it gets more validation, as it gets more market share, all of those kind of are calculated within the valuation. Um, and it's a core deal-making tool. So if you look at the, you know, the Shark Tanks and the Dragonstein and these different names in different countries, that's what they're talking about when they talk about how much for share it's a valuation. At the same time, it's a clear indicator that the valuation is not fixed to stone. It's, there is no one logical way, a formula to calculate the right valuation, because at the end of the day, the real valuation is something that someone agrees to pay for it with their work, with their money. And as, as, as a way of saying the valuation is a guesstimate, it's a guess feeling an opinion-based statement that we think it's worth this. Someone else says, I think it's worth that. And it depends on their perspective and what things they value more, what things they value less. It's like art. You know, how do you say what is the value of Mona Lisa painting? It is the previous price that was paid, but has it changed? Increased, decreased, and if so, why? 
So what I encourage is that don't spend too much money paying for a content to try to, you know, calculate your valuation uh, because it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. You should have more of a uh, of a valuation that is based on multiple perspective because that's more how the stock market also does it at very high volume and scale. But at the same time, the valuation is what you feel is right for your company and that you can convince others to believe and pay for that value. So here's more about the cash investment valuation is typically lower. So basically the value of money is, is uh, with, with money you can get a, get a bigger share. But again, it's only as real as validated. But there are certain guidelines to have, like what is the value in the certain states and where does the value come from? Where does the justification of the value come from? So let's go through quickly the perspective into the valuation uh, building up. Um, before that, let's check out the, the advisors and mentors and their world and, and what is the, the, the reason. So the role of an advisor usually like it's different than board member. Board members have legal responsibilities of the company. So board members have in, uh, uh, responsibilities that are defined in, uh, in company law regulations. So usually then advisors are someone who don't have a official role in the board. So that's why they're called like board of advisors. So what they can give is advice and perspective, but they don't have decision making power. So it's important when you seek for advisors that you make a specific, there's advisors that you know provide their services free or through small payment through some support services that are available in the ecosystem. But then there are those advisors who make a, a more committed uh, deal with the founders or startup to be there for a certain period of time and have a certain availability uh, to help the, the, the startup. And for that, you definitely need to make an agreement. And it's more of a sweat equity type of an agreement. What time of availability they will give you over for how long period of time and how much equity would they get for providing that service or that availability for you to ask questions is, is the type of deal. And it's key here to separate two types of advisors, those who have experience in building startups, so like serial entrepreneurs uh, or in investors or those who have worked in the space for a long time, understand the building process versus those who have some other skills like a lawyer or accountant or a technical guy or a designer and where you should consider only their advice specific of where their expertise are and then only take um, you know, their opinions when it comes to how you should build a company from those who actually have experience on that side. So the value of advisors and mentors is, is really that uh, there's always limitation for what you can know, how much you can know, how much it even makes sense for you to learn and know versus how easily and quickly you can get that knowledge from, from someone that you can uh, attach uh, or get them invited to your company. So oftentimes you don't know or learn to know more or you will through the advisors. And uh, you should really think of your own knowledge as one view and all of the other advice you get as another view. Like if you think about three-dimensional object, when you're looking at it from one direction or you're looking from another direction, you get a better perspective of how that problem or how that solution or how that situation looks like. 
and always make your own decisions. So regardless, when you ask from no knowledgeable people, knowledgeable of that specific subject, and you ask many enough, you can pretty quickly learn to see a pattern of their response. How do they respond? What is the common denominator to help you guide kind of what is the, the, the three-dimensional object, object that you're looking at? But never ever make a decision based on anyone's recommendation or individual opinion unless you share that strongly with yourself. So always take advice only as advice, regardless of whom it comes from, because only you have the deeper knowledge and context of where that advice is applied to. Uh, they will never have a deep understanding that you have accumulated through your own learning from your company. So you kind of have to match this uh, yourself and with your team uh, and make your own decisions. So you feel comfortable of those. So it really comes down to building this perspective, whatever the issue at hand, this is what advisors help you get a more holistic picture. And here's a, just a funny small picture to communicate how we see di things differently. So I think we can say both of these are in trouble. So the other one is really happy to see a boat being on the land, on the island. So the boat is a way out. And the other one has been on the boat, on the ocean, for quite some time, is happy to get to the land. So, depends on the perspective how you see the matter. So, as a founder versus advisor, you have different kind of uh, view to the matter. So, us looking from a third dimension or third perspective to this, we can say both of them are strong. So what is the value, how to use, so to test or thinking, think your theories. So you need the theories to get feedback so you can test your theories, you can get your assumptions. And if you don't, I mean, an advisor is different than a customer. The customer will actually, with their behavior, validate certain things. But with advisors, you can get additional theories or you can kind of hone out some of the rough edges you can improve or you can come up with additional theories to test. So always opt for real testing, for real valuation. So it doesn't matter whose opinion it is, opinion is an opinion. So only a tested and validated thing makes it true. So always also check the time, how much you uh, use time in theory and how much you use your time in actually testing the theory. So use more time in testing the theories than come up, coming up with theories. At least find the right balance by doing it enough. 